everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Bridging the OT Data to Visibility Divide, sponsored by Dragos and Keysight Technologies. My name is Carol Off of SANS, and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speakers are Phil Trainer, Director in Keysight Technologies Security Solutions Group, and Mike Hoffman, Principal Industrial Consultant at Dragos. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenters, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to turn the webcast over to our presenters. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining the session. I'm very much looking forward to giving you some insights on the important aspect of getting visibility into your, your environments, but more importantly, getting visibility to where it matters because of what is taking place currently in the ICS environment. Phil, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure, I'm happy to be speaking here today. I have a pretty deep background in network security and I've recently been doing a lot of work on the ICS side of that and I'll pass it back to Mike. Awesome. So just a little bit about me as I get the uh, slides to work here. The industry about 20 some years it came out from the controls and automation perspective and uh, worked in many plants upstream, downstream in oil and gas and moved into security along the way. Also I'm fortunate to be uh, working with SANS also in their ICS curriculum and uh, looking forward to begin to help teach their 612 class when we uh, get it going on a face-to-face. -face. So let's talk about the risks and threats that we see today. So as many of you are aware on this webcast, ransomware has absolutely been a, a prevalence in our environments. And, and one of the things around ransomware and these other attacks that adversaries are doing is that a lot of owners and operators have the challenge of not being able to see their environment. And because they can't see it, they're having a problem with defending it. And so we see that over and over again. So again, with ransomware, uh, you know, affecting pipeline operations, we can think of recent areas around supply chain compromise, where you know tools that are being used uh, in the IT space and also the OT space for administration, management of network equipment, and so forth, and even visibility have been compromised and leading to you know just a, a lot of you know IR work and those kind of things. But again, a lot of this is taking place because of or or you know asset owners and operators are struggling to even detect when these things are occurring. We see remote ass you know, assets attacks on critical infrastructure environments and, and water industries and other industries, and definitely targeted ICS attacks as well, just, just where the adversary is looking to cause disruption and harm in these environments. And often this brings um, you know, impacts to business. And these are not small impacts, as we saw on the loss of a pipeline where it drastically affected supply of fuel and those kind of things to the East Coast. So, so there's a massive impact to downtime of operations. There's an impact to safety. If, if an adversary gets into the environment and disrupts a device or a safety system, it can definitely impact safety. And also IP theft. A lot of times we don't talk about IP theft, but certainly in certain industries, uh, you know, you can think of where there's batch processes or recipes going on. Food and pharma are great examples. Catalyst is another example of IP theft that is one area where that could take place, where a company is relying on the intellectual property of their recipes. And if those were stolen, that is actually their most critical or crown jewel. And again, all this leads to uh, impacts on financial as well. So definitely an, an area of being able to detect and, and defend your environments with visibility. So what does good visibility mean for cybersecurity and for your programs? It's really around understanding what you have. Uh, one of the challenges I had working as asset owner and operator was understanding today what was in my environment. And that really matters because when we identify the important you know, systems in our environment, what we would call as crown jewels and dragos. But you know, again, again, those are called other things in other areas, but essentially what your most important and critical asset is in your environment, what talks to that? What, what is that linked to? What can compromise it? All of those things, visibility will help answer those questions. It also helps understand system relationships. You may not think that your, or you may think your systems are islanded, air gapped. Uh, probably not. Uh, that that myth has kind of gone away. But nevertheless, you may think certain systems are are locked down from a, you know, an access perspective, system to system or your user to system communication. 
they may not be, or you may have very, very tight coupling between your OT systems and your IT systems around um, you know, payment and, and order processing and all those things. Visibility helps to understand what is connected to where. Also identified at atrophied controls and weaknesses. And this, this is one of those things that a, a lot of times we work on you know, projects and those kind of things, security projects where we implement security controls and they're good, they're tight, they're locked down. But over time, our, our systems are changing. And so firewall rules get, get opened up or during tr troubleshooting operations where you're trying to add in you know, more, more systems, more devices, uh, maybe get your historian reconfigured and different architected. All of those things may lead to atrophied controls where what was good is now not so good, but you don't know. And again, understanding those traffic flows and ports and protocols through visibility extremely helps. Also finding vulnerabilities. Vulnerability management is a very, very challenging aspect in the OT space without proper controls and, and tools. And so trying to do vulnerability management manually is almost impossible. There has to be a way to, where you can get that information automatically. And then of course, misconfigurations is a great one as well, where looking into your environment and understanding you know, maybe where you know, things are misconfigured. I've seen this and I've used visibility tools multiple times in this area where HMIs were trying to, you know, they were, the, they were misconfigured and trying to talk to different networks and so forth and during troubleshooting operations. So visibility tools really help in this area. A lot of times when we think about, you know, areas where, um, you know, where in visibility, this is actually a more advanced topic. And I love the slide um, from Rob Lee's class, ICS 515, where we talk about the sliding scale of security. And a lot of times we think about, you know, visibility tools around it, it's more of a active defense approach where you're, you're threat hunting in the environment. Ultimately though, to get visibility and, and to use it properly, it actually starts far left over an architecture. And so getting asset visibility at, at that point of architecture, it's, it's really, it, it helps to identify your architecture, establish proper architecture, validate your architecture. And then it also helps as we move over to passive defense, where we look at firewalls and, and those, all of those other controls that we put in place to properly protect and harden our environment. It'll, it'll identify where those systems are properly implemented and also where they're not. It'll also identify flat networks and those kind of things. So again, it identifies and, and helps to establish where you know, passive defenses are working properly and where there's areas for improvement. And then of course, active defense. And this is where there's that human element in the environment doing threat hunts and so forth can only be done with proper monitoring and visibility in the environment. And so asset visibility really begins in the architecture, the full left perspective, and, and it supports these other processes. So from, from this perspective, you know, a lot of times we think about automated asset visibility and from coming from operations and coming from automations and systems, uh, one of the things that, that, you know, what was so apparent for me is the need to have automated visibility. And this comes back to a lot of the times when we think about looking, you know, trying to establish what is in our systems, what do we have, uh, what's working. A lot of times we try to implement manual tools. So we implement spreadsheets and we create wonderful drawings. These, these type of things where we go into our environments and we, we take track and take collection of our information manually is a real challenge to keep that up to date. Plus it, it doesn't account for all the change that occurs. So when you think of change in there and especially multiple environments that we're in where there's critical you know, process safety requirements and so forth, certain things go under management of change. So those are tracked. So change is when they occur under management of change, process safety, you definitely have to you know, document and account for and, and make sure the right parties are involved. But a lot of times we find in the OT environment, there's a gray space where maybe a change isn't being done that affects or, or that spawns off a formal management of change, but changes do occur and they occur actually all the time. And, and they're very challenged to keep documented. Also, there's that mindset of, of these OT systems, you know, don't change between outages. And that's simply not true. From my uh, you know, experience in, in different operations, our environments change quite a bit. There are always small projects going on where, you know, where you're adding 
maybe new vibration monitors. You have a small you know, project over here to add a couple more consoles for operations. You know, maybe you're doing a substation upgrade and you're adding some more monitoring characteristics and those kind of things in that area or on, on a platform or on a ship. You name the environment, small changes occur all the time. And unless you're actually accounting for those in an automated fashion, you'll lose an understanding of actually what's going on in your environment. So it's really critical to when you're thinking about visibility and, and when you're thinking even about asset inventory, all of those things kind of play in hand in hand. And it's critical to do, you know, to make sure that you're actually automating this process as much as possible. So when we think about the benefits of visibility, well, certainly we can think about this from an operations perspective of the controls engineers. I've used visibility to tools in the past, again, at different sites where, you know, you know, again, when we're talking about upgrades or, you know, implementing projects and those kind of things, we're working hand in hand with controls engineers um, and, and where you may be doing reconfigurating your DCS systems or your SCADA systems. So understanding, um, you know, the, the new traffic flows that are occurring and so forth and helping them troubleshoot. I remember a time where we were trying to, where we were having a lot of problems on a DCS server and it was due to too many OPC connections coming into that. But it was only through the use of some of these visibility tools that we were able to identify that and correct that by changing some of our OPC clients uh, to a different server. That's just one of those ways it really helps operations. And then of course, security from the security and analyst. Being able to actually see the environment is so critical to understanding you know, the security landscape and what is actually going on in your systems, what ports and protocols are being used, what, what type of malicious activities could be occurring, behaviors and that kind of thing, what changes have occurred, uh, have, you know, have new protocols spun up, are new systems talking to each other. All of those things are extremely critical to that security analyst role. And then also the plant manager, that person who is actually responsible uh, and, and accountable for their plant or for that, that environment they're in charge of. Uh, being able to, you know, when there's a new vulnerability released or when something weird happens to the environment, being able to talk to operations and, and support personnel to ask those questions and get those answered correctly so that they know uh, how to safely uh, manage their plant and their environment. Uh, what kind of you know things do they need to do uh, if something does occur? Uh, they're the really people that are uh, ultimately in charge and accountable for their site. And also, when we think about indirect uh, benefits for leadership for the C-suite board, to actually understand, you know, real time again, I go back to that vulnerability thing where, you know, if, if there's this new critical vulnerability out there, to be able to scan your entire um, your entire fleet of equipment to be able to answer that, am I, does this concern me or not from a business perspective? Also look long-term from, from that life cycle management perspective. What do we have out there? What do we need to be upgrading in the next couple of years? How much money do we need to be spending on, on our system? You know, and those kind of, those kind of things will eventually bubble up to leadership in those perspectives. And so when we hit to this point, it's really about how much visibility do we need? And so a lot of times we, we think about the easiest point when we draw a circle around the DMZ. And the DMZ, of course, is your north-south traffic. And this is really, really good to have this kind of perspective around the north-south traffic because most of the connections, and I'll talk about this in the next couple of slides, but most connections will come from the IT and eventually hit somewhere in the DMZ if it's configured correctly. So being able to detect that north-south traffic is critical to your security posture. The better approach is to actually draw a circle around the level three for your operations. And so because most plants and in larger environments, the level three is where you have systems that actually report and, and communicate to lower systems and also to upper systems. Uh, to level 3.5 and the level 2 and below. These systems are, again, they're normally a cross plant. They, they may connect into multiple SCADA systems and or DCS systems. Uh, and to have that visibility to understand what types of things are occurring there at, at that level is really good, but it's not what we are really looking for. And so if we draw a line around this entire stack, that's really what we need to be focusing on because down here is where you're actually encompassing the, the HMIs, you're encompassing what's going on in your alarm systems. And, and, and actually the critical devices were around your PLCs, what are actually affecting your plant floor, the RTUs on the well pads and substations, your motor controllers and drives and so forth. 
and then of course relays and 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 those other lower level systems down at at your sensors instrumentation and you know a lot of of the instruments are are becoming smart have bus protocols and so forth so we see you know in the future today and and tomorrow a further need to get visibility down at the actual level zero nevertheless focusing on the level two and level one is is really to get the most value out of a lot of these systems and we call that the east-west traffic so when we think about this and when we think about communications and, and really what we need to be monitoring, this kind of goes back to that discussion of a kill chain. And so how attacks actually occur. Now the kill chain, of course, the Lockheed Martin kill chain kind of breaks it out into a stage one attack. And the stage one attack is all about outlining how an attacker actually you know, goes through the different motions of you know, doing OSINT and finding out uh, exploits and those kind of things, leveraging those exploits in the IT environment. The stage one attack, though, talks about how and, and outlines how that attacker will get into the environment. But for us in the OT space, we're looking at the stage two attacks. And that's where really you can see where that divide and that bridge happens between the corporate world and the OT world. And so getting visibility across the stage one into stage two is really what is important. Now, when we think about this, when we think about the, law, the, the kill chain, what that's talking about really is these chain of actions that have to, or normally have to occur for this attack to carry out and to, you know, for those actions on objectives to occur. Now, if you break the chain somewhere and hopefully higher up in that level, the attacker, that exploit or that action on objectives will fail. So what's really nice about thinking about attacks in, in terms of a chain is, is thinking about your defenses and your security posture and where you can break that chain at the higher level. So when we think about this from sensor placement, so we've talked about the importance of, of getting visibility you know, at the lower levels. And this diagram just kind of illustrates how a lot of architectures are laid out. Now, I know when you actually get into plants and environments, they're way more complicated in this higher level drawing. You know, you may have huge uh, implementations of SCADA systems and multiple well pads or, or hundreds of substations. In, in a plant environment, you may have multiple, you know, layer two DCS systems connected up through and those kind of things, huge, huge implementations. So, but when we actually talk about getting that visibility, you know, we can kind of think of drawing a line from that the external, uh, you know, an access getting into a jump server. And you can kind of think about these communications from either an abuse of trusted access or how an attacker may, you know, again, come through that stage to attack. And then may get onto some sort of a jump server or, or even, you know, get into a, a misconfigured on the patch side or AV. And, and they may draw a line and connect down into one of the SCADA systems if we're talking about a remote site. And there, you know, they may, you know, be able to do certain functions and control commands and so forth. And, and then also we can draw a line between the HMIs and the historian. If you can think about that, a lot of the historians will connect down into the HMIs. And so being able to monitor that traffic is extremely important. And again, on the north, north, south type traffic moving up and down in, in the protocol stack. So placing a sensor at this location is one of the key things to do. And it's, a, it's one of the easier locations where you can actually monitor your environment. However, that's not normally enough. What we really want to do is draw a line between where those SCADA systems are actually connecting down the PLCs or draw a line to where those PLCs are connecting over those RTUs. And, and that's essentially where that sensor can come in and, and, and actually look at that command traffic and be able to understand, you know, if somebody did compromise that SCADA, you know, server, what kind of commands are they doing uh, after the remote stations and so forth. So being able to, to monitor and get that visibility there at that level is actually what is most important. And then if we pivot over to the plant side and we draw a line between that HMI server and the DCS controller, again, that is one of the, the areas on the, on the plant perspective of if our, our equipment can understand those protocols and dissect them properly to be able to identify, you know, our set points changing, our, our different uh, start stop commands changing and those kind of things. So, so being able to, you know, to you know, place a sensor in this location is really critical to understanding that type of operations down at that local uh, environment in that plant. So as we draw, draw further lines of communication in here and place sensors, you know, where that DCS controller connects to the PLC, we definitely need to be monitoring traffic down on that layer one to layer two 
locations within the plant, and that's where that sensor can be, uh, you know, readily used. So, so again, when we think about this, you know, th there's there's definitely a, a need for that lower level type of visibility in the environment. So, not just at level three, not just in your DMZ, but but completely all the way down the stack. Now, as we go to the next slide, there are some definite challenges in this, you know, in these environments. And this is the hard part because it's easy to place sensors on a slide and say, this is where you need to, to you know, get this visibility. But when we actually look into these environments, it's really difficult to know, uh, you know, there, we have physical limitations, we have old switches and so forth uh, that may not have, that may not be Spanish, uh, managed. Most of them are nowadays. I've, I've still come across some old switches that don't have capability for spans or port mirroring. Um, so that's not always you know, available to, to hook up your sensing devices. Also, um, you know, a lot of times when we look down the, the level two areas, we see that you know, it's very highly segmented environments. So it requires a lot of different uh, monitoring points. So that can get challenging when you're trying to aggregate this traffic back into a sensor. And then of course, bandwidth limitations. And so, so even when you're thinking about remote environments, a lot of times the option comes up, well, let's remote span that. Let's take a complete capture of that traffic and, and duplicate that and put that back in the network and then push that over to a sensor in another location. But oftentimes these networks are 100 megabit or they're remote, they're going through a, you know, a, a, a VSAT or a cell type connection or something like that on a SCADA side where this just simply does not work. And so this is where you know technologies that that Keysight offers really helped in dealing with these challenges of actually getting that visibility and down this lower sections of the network. And with that, I'll turn it over to Phil and let him fill you in on some of those things that Keysight can offer. Awesome, thanks, Mike. Thank you so much for telling us that. Okay, so I'm gonna start talking about how Keysight works in this world that Mike just talked about. So I'm gonna start off by discussing. ITOT security from an adversarial standpoint. It's a, one of the things that Keysight does very well. So let's say that if we remember what Mike talked about earlier, I mean, typically we're gonna see a, uh, unless we're dealing with a malicious insider, the goal of a attack is to first breach level four in the IT side. They wanna invade that plant's local business apps, the workstation, the email, the servers over there. That's gonna be their first point of entry. And from there, they're gonna to wanna to try to perform some of those lower level attacks that Mike was talking about, getting to the ICS DMZ and then the, the plant wide control. So let's, let's talk about some techniques that they're gonna do in order to try to get into that level four on the Purdue model. What you're seeing right here is a screen grab from one of Keysight's SecOps tools called Threat Simulator. Threat Simulator is a breach and attack solution that attempts to send malicious content from our dark cloud to an endpoint that can be dropped anywhere. In this case, we're gonna drop one in level four of an ITS network connected to an OT network, supposedly with a major enforcement boundary, but let's see how first breach goes before we get too much further. What's interesting about this, is this is, this is TrickBot right here. And these are the 46 different actions that are taken uh, place by the malware within TrickBot in order to infiltrate the machine that it's targeting. And TrickBot is something that was very much leveraged when targeting ICS networks over the last year. Typically people are going to be sending this malware to their targets either through phishing attempts or even drive-by attempts. There's a lot of different ways to send this over and it's been very successful in doing so. This is what Keysight's Threat Simulator will create and send to a endpoint in a layer four network. The premise of doing that is to make certain that the, the security controls on that level are able to indeed stop TrickBot from taking place. What TrickBot does during its uh, attack sequence is it uses 10 different MITRE attack techniques, including 13 sub techniques. And it's crucial to be able to say, can all of these, let me actually go back to all 46, can all 46 of these actions be stopped by a security module. And that's a stack ops tool like Threat Simulator will do in order to ensure that level four isn't being infiltrated. So what's the attack, what's the goal of a level four infiltration? Obviously as before, it's to go 
lower down to level three. You want to get to those plant-wide control networks. You want to talk to the asset managers, the historians, all those different levels that Mike was talking about a little bit earlier. So once you're inside level three, and let's assume that since you are either a malicious insider or you were able to successfully drop malware or some other malicious package inside the level four network, you're able to now start doing your level one attacks from the level three network. This is kind of interesting right here. I grabbed all of the current ICS attacks, the CVEs for programmable logic controllers and different level one assets. You can see here on the far right side, this is ICSA, 21 for 2021, 2019, 18, 17. You can see here when I am grabbing into a word count for them, the number of viable exploits is going up and up and up and up. What's interesting about that is the fact that this really, to me, what this indicates is more people are researching this. More people are trying to find flaws in these different devices. More people are devoting energy and time and money into doing this. What's even more interesting is these are the ones that are widely known and published. There's probably a whole score that are not, that people are holding on to. And that's really what we're going after here in the visibility game of ICS security. Because in order to see attacks and see different scenarios, you need to have complete visibility. And it's something that a combination of a facilitating solution like Keysight and a very security-driven solution like Dragos combines to give users. So let's talk about how does Keysight work in the OT network for visibility. We make taps and packet brokers. Our taps are meant for the absolute faithful replication of every single packet that hits the wire. It's far more trustworthy than using the span port on a uh, switch. Furthermore, our taps are ruggedized to deal with some very intense conditions to ensure that they work. A level above that also are our network packet brokers. Network packet brokers deliver the correct packet to the correct tool every time. We're able to perform a lot of actions, like we're able to aggregate traffic together. We're able to take our traffic and send it to multiple different endpoint solutions. Let's say you have a Dragos in your network, but you also want a copy of every single packet traversing levels three and two in order to send them to long-term storage in case of an incident response or just to be uh, compliant for whatever reason. You're able to do that with a Keysight network packet broker. And that's the real value of these. You can see how these are mostly being deployed in the level three and the level two of the model. What you're seeing right here is this is the graphical user interface of our network packet brokers. On the very far end, these are two interfaces in which traffic is traversing. It could be Modbus, DMP3, it could be whatever traffic inside of your OT network. We create a concept called a dynamic filter. Dynamic filters can do most anything layer two all the way up to layer seven on that traffic. We can look for very specific talkers, certain IP addresses, certain protocols. We can look for unusual activity, such as if we were to all of a sudden see traffic from a machine that shouldn't be talking, and we do dynamic application discovery as well. But in this case, on this interface right here, this gets to the span port, this interface says, okay, make me a whole bunch of copies of all of that traffic. And I wanna send these to lots of different security tools. I want Dragos to get a copy of every single packet. I wanna send others to virtual machines that are running, I mean, different rules and different investigative programs. I wanna send things to long-term storage so I have a copy of everything. I'm able to make those decisions. What's furthermore very useful about our network packet brokers is we do this with almost a negligible loss of latency. These aren't pizza boxes that are doing switching inside of just a software stack. We do everything in hardware. We're all FPGA based. So this is all decisions being made by NAND and NOR gates. So you're gonna get in the nanoseconds in terms of latency added in order to make these kind of decisions. This is the kind of professional grade facilitation of network traffic to your security tools like Dragos that you need to have in a network where the stakes are as high as when you're in the OT space.
And that's the real value that Keysight brings to the table is that faithful, perfect, almost latency-less delivery of network traffic. So let's jump back a little bit to what I was talking about before about SecOps. SecOps allows you to perform um, uh, our breach, uh, breach and attack tool in SecOps Threat Simulator allows you to not only send events like the TrickBot malware to an endpoint, but we have a whole slew of different attack scenarios that we will simulate from our dark cloud to sensors that you can drop anywhere into the network. It can run on Linux, it can run on Windows, it can run on anything. You can drop these at different levels of your network. There's no reason why you couldn't put a whole bunch in level three. And you could truly test that major enforcement boundary and see if, let's say that you don't allow vendors or you don't allow certain tranches of, ta of network traffic to go on the ICS DMZ on 3.5, from whatever space in level four down to level three. That major enforcement boundary stops it. Well, do you know what would be great to do? Let's take a SecOps tool like Threat Simulator, let's drop an agent in level three, and let's have the dark cloud be beyond level four, and let's see if I can perform different scans, different attacks. Let me see what I can do with this. And not just now, I want to do it every hour of every day. I want to do it 24 hours a day. And what the key thing that this does is it gives the SOC team, the individuals who are tasked with securing the, I, uh, the OTIT network, it gives them time back. If they're performing red team actions, these are the things that can and should be automated. To seeing, hey, can TrickBot infiltrate the latest endpoint security I've installed on all the Windows 10 machines that are in my level three manufacturing and operation control network? A lot of the graphical user interfaces, whether you're controlling a JACE or an individual PLC's uh, system, a lot of them are running on Windows. And a lot of malware is written specifically targeting not only uh, Windows machines, but Windows machines that are indeed running OT software trying to run a PLC. There's absolutely going to be Windows Defender on that. There's absolutely going to be third-party vendors that are running their security stack on that system, their endpoint security solution, attempting to secure that system from everything. Why not make sure it works 24 hours a day? And same thing with network level attacks. Why not make certain that SQL injections, cross-site scripting attacks, and another whole slew of different scenarios. We have tens of thousands of these that can be run from level four into level three continuously. More importantly than almost anything is our recommendation engine. If you have your recommendation engine turned on, you're able to say, okay, something got through. What actions should I take in order to rectify these flaws in the network currently? And that's a very important thing. So between the recommendation engine and the automation of doing this action, you will get fail, pass, fail, pass. And what you can do with this is something very important. You can trend how secure something. If you can't measure something, then you can't improve it. You want to constantly be trending towards a more secure network, constantly patching and really increasing the velocity in which your organization is closing holes, finding flaws and working. And automation and SecOps is a critical, critical component to that. You can even take a further step back. Um, Threat Simulator is meant to work in a production network. You drop your agents in production network, you're testing 24-7. We have other solutions like Breaking Point that's meant for lab testing. Let's say that you're considering putting a solution inside of the OT or IT network, it's an inline security solution, and you want to see how well it can block attacks, and Breaking Point is the solution for doing that. You can set up the endpoint and the uh, client for this and say, okay, run all of my SCADA attacks. Now run them obfuscated. Now run them out of order. Now change things up. This will definitely give you a snapshot as to how well per, a piece of security solution can be dropped inside of a network beforehand. And it's a very good risk mitigating solution. Now let's talk about our visibility solutions again. I mentioned earlier that they're ruggedized and that is crucial. Depending on what kind of OT network you're dealing with, a lot of them have issues in terms of either being incredibly hot or incredibly cold or steam or different scenarios like that. We have, as you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, we have a whole slew of ruggedized taps, and ruggedized network packet brokers. And the, the premise of these is to ensure that solutions like Dragos or any other solution in your network that needs a copy of every single packet traversing your OT network gets that packet faithfully, gets it every time. And that's essentially really why you would 
choose to do this, which is, in my opinion, the best possible way to go about doing this action. So in summation, I have four key takeaways. First one is utilizing a SecOps tool, a breach and attack tool like Threat Simulator, dropping agents in level three and having attacks come from level four or level five. If you are constantly performing these actions, if you're constantly security auditing your OT and IT networks, you will be able to measure effectively how secure the network is and trend that over time to always be moving towards a more secure environment. The automation of doing that absolutely allows you to free up cycles of your SOC operators who spend all of their time trying to secure the network and any moment you can give them back by automating a critical task, that is something that also makes your network not only run more efficiently in terms of human resources, but also gives your people the ability to work on more high level tasks. This one's probably the most important of all, and it ties a lot back to what Mike was talking about with Dragos. Are critical security resources seeing every packet on your network? This is what Keysight does. With our ruggedized taps and network packet brokers, we will ensure even in incredibly harsh conditions that the Drago solutions of the world are getting every single packet, every critical packet, so it can make its very important observations looking for indicators of breach. And lastly, another point I didn't make a bit earlier was that our TAPs, our network packet brokers, they can all be uh, augmented to work in high availability, uh, high availability mode and to fail open, which are also critical things because visibility can never be lapsed for even a moment in OT networks. That's all I have for right now. I really appreciate everyone tuning in today to uh, catch this webinar with myself and Mike. And if there are any questions, we'd be happy to field them. All right, thanks for that great presentation. We have a question. It says, what are the taps connected in the PERA or PARA model to send back the information to the security tool? Um, so the question is, what are the taps connected to? Yes. I mean, they can uh, be connected to any ethernet uh, uh, port of anything. I mean, it's, it's their power over ethernet and their or they have batteries in them, depending on whether they're packet brokers or aggregators or not. But the answer is anything. Um, any point in time, at any junction, if you want a copy of traffic, you can implement a tap there. All right, thanks. And if I can uh, add on to that, you, you oh, often find taps where you have choke points in your network. So uh, a, good, a good area of that is where you have a core switch or a core areas where you have controllers talking to uh, you know, your HMIs or servers. And, and so that, that point of aggregation where all that traffic is flowing through is a great point to put your your taps. Now taps, like, just like Phil had said, go in line. So they don't go off of a switch or off of your router, they go in line. So it, you can, as Phil talked about, you can do copper taps and then you can do fiber taps. Fiber taps are great because you're dealing with light. You're just taking a, a slice of light off and and so there's no there the failure modes of fiber taps are a lot less than copper taps. Nevertheless, they're both excellent products. So whatever you however you you've got your network laid out, uh, a tap is available for that medium. Um, so but but it is mainly you put taps in points of aggregation or where that your the data of that you're wanting to monitor flows flows through that or flows over it. All right, thank you both. Uh, someone else says excellent debate. Thank you. Another question asks, how long is the duration for implementation? And it's probably a well, question for Dragos. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and it, really, it really depends. So implementation, um, it can it can kind of go on, on both ways. So, so implementation can very much be um, from the, the network perspective of, of getting that, that monitoring down but, but it can also be you know implementing the sensors as well. So so it it very very much depends on the complexity in the environment. Small plants uh, where where you have you know PLC controlled plants or so forth, uh, you you're you're talking about just a handful of sensors, maybe a um, you know one centralized uh, collection point, and those kind of things. Um, it, so you're talking about you know it's I, I I've put in. Solutions such as these before, within you know, you put you know you put it in in a, in a day or two, you 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 tune it uh, for a week or, or so, and then you're you're ready to go. Uh, other um, environments are way uh, more challenging than that. So it all depends on your environment, the complexity, 
And also you really need to understand how your control systems work. Um, and so, so normally, you know, uh, companies such as Dragos will go in and actually have an understanding of where, you know, the, the important communications are taking place at what switch pairs you, you need to connect into and so forth. So it's not just about, um, you know, putting sensors in the environment in these locations, it's where we're at in these locations is to put the sensor into. So, so you really need to understand how your, your control system works. And, and most, or I would not say most, but a large portion of the asset owners and operators have that understanding or, that, or they have people within the companies that they know their systems well, that they, they know how the controllers talk to uh, the servers and HMIs and so forth, or, or where their traffic is being routed around to. And that's what you put your sensor in. So first of all, it's, it's actually understanding your environment first which is which often will take a step back and, and say, okay, do you have, do you have an architecture done? Uh, do you have drawings? So at least we know how it's things are laid out. If not, um, you can pull PCAPs and begin to understand your architecture just from that. And then you can go begin to put a plan into place to where the sensors are actually connected into. So, so it can vary between days, weeks, months, <laughs> depending upon the size of your facilities and, uh, and architectures. All right, thanks. Um, we have a follow-up from the question before this last one. He says, I mean, do I need to punch holes in the firewall to allow TAPS to report back to the security tool? Oh, um, absolutely not. Um, like, what, like what Mike said a little bit earlier, uh, major junction points are great, but essentially you're going to have like either fiber or copper um, cable, and you're going to essentially either take two or even cut it and clamp it if that's what you're inclined to do or with fiber and you're going to instead of having one go straight across you're going to have in out and then the um the copy of it and that's just essentially you are literally tapping it and everything that traverses that line you will get an exact copy of it, it has absolutely nothing to do with the firewall and essentially you want to send it to a tool like dragos is an out of band solution they're, they're not sitting in the network they're uh, they're not they're not a bump in the wire like a, like a Palo Alto or a source fire. And they're learning things and I'm looking for uh, extremely uh, specific uh, changes happening based off listening to traffic. And listening to that by doing it through a tap is the ideal way. Um, did you want to add to that, Mike, at all? Yeah, exactly. Um, and and that's, that's a very good point. And, and I see that question asked a lot, you know, do we actually need to open up, you know, holes in our firewall to get our security tools in place? And that's definitely not the need. And, and just like Phil had mentioned, uh, you know, tools such as Dragos listen to the traffic. So you can listen to a traffic based off of, of a span port, uh, or if you don't have that capability again, it, you can put taps in. And, and taps are, you know, by far, um, if, if you're thinking about, you know, the, the gradients of not getting into your network and not having the capability, uh, I, I do know of a, uh, there, there's a CV out uh, you know, about, um, you know, a, a concern around, you know, a span port being able to talk back through a span port because theoretically you shouldn't be able to do that or not. It wasn't span, but it was a mirroring as a different manufacturer. Nevertheless, though, uh, for for any concerns around that, um, you know, being able to actually tap the traffic, uh, tap those communications is, is by far, um, you know, again, least impactful to your environment once you make that connection. It's getting taps in place in a running environment. It can be challenging unless you have redundant communications just because you're actually breaking that connection to put the tap in. Once the tap is in place, then it's, it's there and it doesn't affect the environment from then on out. So, um, but, but, but again, once, that, once you're listening to that communication, tools such as Dragos are completely out of band. Um, now you can, you can, you can, there's a management piece of these tools. Again, you have a management console. That console can be within the network or you can create a management VLAN as well. And so depending upon, um, you know, how, you know, different asset owners and operators uh, construct their environment, you will see sometimes a, a completely separate management network for that or an inbound or in-band management network uh, to get into some of these, the, the sensors and the site store and those kind of things. Um, but, but again, that's, that's um, for managing the devices and for getting metadata out of it, uh, not necessarily for the replication of traffic, so. All right, thanks. Questions. We have one that says, follow-up question on opening the firewall. How would the dark cloud reach the lower levels without going through the firewall? 
oh, we're talking about SecOps, a threat simulator now, correct. Um, so the answer is it would absolutely go through the firewall and hopefully the firewall stops it. Um, that's the whole premise of those SecOps uh, automated tools. I wanna put an agent somewhere in level three and I wanna have our dark cloud in level four or level five and I want it to fail. I want it to fail every time. I never want it to succeed, but if it does, it'll tell you right away. So yeah, don't don't give your firewall uh, a hole. Let it do its job, and hopefully the um, uh, the attacks being done from our dark cloud to our agent. And if our agent's on a Linux system, it, or it's always being done in Docker, it's always communicating on its own, it's never in, it's never infecting things, it's never going off, it's going to adjust our agents, but the premise of it is I wanna see it fail. Every time, please, because if it doesn't fail, that means it got through and that's a bigger problem, but you wanna know those things, and that's really the premise of it. So to answer your question, don't give your firewall a heads up. All right, thanks, Phil. We have another question for you. It says, does the product packet broker replay malicious traffic? Or does it also actively try to exploit a vulnerability if found? I'm terribly sorry about that. Could you repeat that one more time? I was coughing. Sure. Does the product packet broker replay malicious traffic or does it also actively try to exploit a vulnerability if found? Um, I think we're conflating two different things, but I'll answer the question. So network packet brokers are inline devices that will make copies of uh, network traffic and send it over to solutions like Drago's. Our SecOps tools uh, do intentionally send malicious traffic from point A to point B, and it will never do something it's not set up to do. It will not go off on its own and attempt to um, just, uh, it, it will not autonomously make a decision. You will create some very specific assessment scenarios, and you'll say, I'm concerned about TrickBot going from level four to level three. And I have a firewall in between these two, and I have an endpoint uh, security system on the endpoint. I want to know how well CrowdStrike or Carbon Black plus Windows Defender plus Palo Alto inline is going to stop this. Um, it's crucial to try this out because, um, like, for example, TrickBot and lots of other different malware scenarios, first they have to go across the network. And that involves doing static analysis, usually with like Yara rules and whatnot. I mean, unless you're doing something with FireEye, it's not going to remotely, it's not going to detonate the malware before it sends it. I mean, and then a lot of communications are encrypted. I mean, you want to make certain that the malware can't go from layer four to layer three. That's essentially what it'll do. All right, thank you so much, Phil and Mike, for your great presentation, and to Dragos and Keysight Technologies for sponsoring this webcast, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.